Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics, and this can be seen along with my other books at www.philosophypublishing.com. The purpose of The Philosophical Angle is to examine concepts in current media and compare its essence with the usage and circumstances in how they are being used. So with that in mind, let us get to with the current topic, which was suggested on a TV program. I believe it was on CNBC and the Larry Kudlow Show when Art Laffer declared that government expenditures and Deficit spending, specifically deficit spending, is a tax on the economy. Well, the philosophical angle would like to explicate that today and detail why this is true. And let's begin. <clears throat> Presently, there is the fiscal cliff crisis that has come before the nation, and it's not going to go away soon because not only is there a question of taxation and should taxes be increased for the wealthy or, or not at all, or, or, or sh should the Bush tax rates expire, or should they be renewed and extended, or whatever comes of the negotiation process is really a small part of the problem because the other side of the picture is the expenditures. Presently, the GOP wants to reduce expenditures. The socialistic Democrats don't want to. So there's kind of an impasse on expenditures and Probably first the taxation will be resolved. But the expenditures probably will not for some time. And the, soon the debt limit ceiling will have to be addressed. All bills of expenditures and revenue have to originate in the House of Representatives. So soon they'll be this issue before them and then before the government, the administration, and the Senate after them. So this question of whether the deficit spending is a tax will very, for, will very shortly become a prominent problem before the world and before the the U.S. Congress. So let's, let's find out why it is. Why it is that Art, Art Laffer's statement is true. First, as we, as we just noted, we have government expenditures, but they're out of control. They're way out of control. It's far uh, exceeding the amount of money that the government takes in. Hence, there's a deficit. And that this deficit is controlled by a ceiling on the amount of money the government can borrow, which is a law originating in the House of Representatives and, and then duly passed in the Senate and by the President. And when this happens, which and this will happen, uh, the, the ceiling will probably happen, uh, will be met in probably the next couple of months, in 2013, and more money will have to be, the limit will have to be uh, uh, increased and more money will be borrowed. But until now, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of borrowing in order to compensate for the deficit between the, what the country takes in and what the country is spending. 
So the U.S. Treasury goes out and borrows the money. Well, where do they get it? <clears throat> they get it from investors, such as overseas governments who have uh, extra money on hand, from commerce and from their revenue. They come in and purchase the U.S. bonds for payment in the future. Presently, the interest rates are very low. So the government has a good deal right now. But when they borrow, the US, when the U.S. Treasury borrows, often investors, and presently investors are really not enough to cover the deficit, the Federal Reserve comes in and prints money. Let's go over here to our chart number two. The Federal Reserve prints money and loans it to the U.S. Treasury. This, over time, will produce inflation. And inflation, as everybody knows, that is a tax. Because the dollars that you, that a person receives or uh, loans out today and then receives from that loan in the future, if there's intervening fl inflation, the dollars or the money that comes back is, of course, worth less. And that's a tax. And who takes that money? Well, the government, because they print the money and they are in charge of the money supply to the Federal Reserve, which is a self-operating, self-governing section of the U.S. government, supposedly independent, but they are influenced heavily by the government. As is seen by the present relationship between the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is printing money, loaning it to the uh, Treasury, and not charging them interest. Maybe they will in the future, but they've stated that whatever they charge, it's going to be low for some time to come. So that's a pretty good deal. And when we get inflation, we're going to call this mathematical inflation. Uh, here back at this chart, I have noted that there are several types of inflation, and we'll get to these in a moment. But the first type is mathematical inflation, and the reason I call it mathematical inflation is because we can describe it with a little bit of algebra. <clears throat> first, Money is backed by the production of the economy. In other words, if there's no production, money has no value. Because money is used in order to acquire what other people have produced. So you go to Walmart or someplace in a retail store and you buy a vacuum cleaner. That's something that somebody else has produced, or it's a service. You can go out and you can go to your dentist, and he can, uh, you'll purchase something that, uh, uh, some service that he has for you, for your dental health. So, production equals money. And the nature of production and everything in production is noted by the risk and the information and knowledge and the time and the effort that goes into making anything. So these are the components of production for a service. And then we add in material and we get a good. So production equals the amount equals money. So then we can say production equals gross domestic product. And so we can also say <coughs> that the certain amount of the money of money inside the economy noted by GDP we can describe as such and so the x number of dollars equals the gross domestic product which equals production so we take that concept up here and we get here the production noted by uh, the risk, the knowledge, 
the time and the effort and the material of what we've produced equals the value of the money of the individual dollar times the number of dollars. And we'll note here money is equal to our production. And when I put right prime, that means the uh, or that means the amount of value in one dollar equals the total amount of production um, in the United States. And so the value of one dollar is the total amount of production divided by the production value of one dollar. So obviously, if the number of dollars increases, goes into a specific amount of production, the value of right prime goes down. Fair enough. This is pretty simple and everybody pretty much understands this. So now let's go to the other forms of taxation that is produced by deficit spending. Well, after they borrow the extra money, they spend it. Well, what do they spend it on? Well, there's a primary purpose of, of the government, which the government will spend, it, uh, spend their, its money on, such as self, uh, uh, national defense, uh, the post office, the judicial system. These are, I call these primary because they're first and noted in the Constitution. It's primary that these are very essential things for the government to do. And so the Founding Fathers spent money on this and put it right into the founding documents. However, then there are secondary purposes. And we're going to put under the, this category, under the secondary, we're going to call this secondary purpose welfare. An example is Obamacare, taking care of the health of of those who don't have health insurance and supplanting your present health system with the government's health system. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. But there's also corporate welfare also. Ethanol, farm supports. Well, this is corporate welfare because you're paying money to a business to establish a certain price or to have them not establish production or to make them produce some more or whatever it is. Corporate welfare is rampant. And these are only two examples of how the U.S. government spends money on corporations to do the, to execute the priorities of the government through the various companies in the United States. And some of these programs are very costly. So welfare of whether it's individual welfare, that is taking care of other individuals, or corporate welfare, whether it's taking care of corporations, Uh, the TARP. TARP was another instance of, of corporate welfare. Too big to fail. You've heard that expression. So what happens in, and why I've listed these government expenditures as a possibility for taxation is because government has an inherent inefficiency to it. And if we take the amount of dollars that go into a secondary purpose of whether it's corporate welfare or individual welfare, and the number of dollars that come to the end product, whatever it is, is somewhere between 1 in 5 and 1 in 10. And that's a tax. That is a because it's much more inefficient to have the government do something. 
So when you have the government do something, the difference between the efficiency of a private enterprise and the government enterprise is vast, and that difference is a tax. Now, this can happen before it, the U.S. dollars are borrowed from the Federal Reserve or from uh, uh, investors wherever they are, or it can happen after it's borrowed or before it's borrowed. So when I say before it's borrowed, I mean the government doesn't borrow all its money. It borrows a certain percentage. Some of it comes from the taxpayers. It coming into the Treasury, and the Treasury spends it as it comes in. But it spends it on whatever purposes that it has, and those purposes before borrowing is inefficient, as well as those dollars used after the borrowing are inefficient. So all those government expenditures on secondary purposes is a tax. A certain percentage of that do of those dollars are tax can be placed in the category of a taxation. But the story is not done. A third type of taxation is that through the is not only through an inefficiency of the operation of government upon money. But the government also produces various regulations and laws. And these also can prevent production from occur ever occurring. A business owner may be confronted by the Environmental Protection Agency, or, and uh, he might decide that he cannot construct a pipeline between importing oil to a refinery in the United States, such as Keystone. Or he may apply for a, a lease on drilling some oil and not be permitted to go, da to go after the oil. Whatever it is, it's a prevention of an efficiency of the market to pursue something it perceives as profitable. This is a tax. Another instance, the, drug, uh, the uh, Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, the cost now to bring a drug to market is closing in on one billion dollars per, per each drug through all the tests that it must pass and adhere to by the government's regulations. And so many drugs that might have been an efficient, might have been used efficiently by markets cannot might be just too expensive for the, for the company to bring it for, forward. And so, they are not brought forward. And because of that, that is an inefficiency. And the prevention, total prevention of these efficiencies coming to market is a tax. So there are three methods by which the government taxes your dollars other than through the means of the IRS, hidden taxation. Through inefficiency, through prevention of efficiency, through our mathematical inflation, and thus our statement by Art Laffer that deficit spending but not only deficit spending, but all spending on secondary purposes of the government or by the government for whatever purpose is or has some sort of taxation inherent 
in its operation. I want to thank you for joining me on this version and this edition of The Philosophical Angle. See you next time.